Good morning, Christ Church of the Valley, and welcome to another Sunday School. This morning, uh, we're going to be in the Book of Romans, and you're going to notice that uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Uh, so obviously, this Devo this morning is a much shorter devotional than others. Well, as of the recording of this video, right now, Christy and I are in week 38 of pregnancy, and it could happen that I need to cut uh, this thing short. Uh, with that, I, I chose to only do a couple verses, only uh, make a short devotional, uh, again, mostly because if something happened and I would have to cut this short, you know. Uh, however, uh, Romans chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 are pregnant with meaning. And yes, I did do that on purpose. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into this. Uh, Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 1 begins with therefore, which connects it to everything Paul has said to this point. Chapter 1 verse 18 through the end of chapter 4 verse 25, including Paul's conclusion regarding the problem. Now the problem would be in chapter 1 verse 18 through three, uh, chapter 3 verse 20, which is everybody has sinned. And of course Paul's solution to this, uh, 321 and uh, through the end of, of chapter 3 and then chapter 4, is that all can be saved by God's grace. All can be saved through Jesus Christ, his propitiate, his death, uh, a propitiation, God the just and the justifier. And all of this, all of that is accomplished by faith. Uh, now, the text here, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse excuse me, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace, or let us have peace. There is a textual variant in this case. Now, what's a textual variant? Well, at this point, I'm going to include a link to my video on why there are so many translations of the Bible, in which I get into this in much more detail. But the point is, uh, for the book of Romans, for chapter 5, verse 1, we have very old manuscripts of this, and we have a variant, and that variant is plausible. That means it appears in good copies, and it changes the meaning of the text. Now, we'll get into how it changes the meaning, but uh, it either says that we have peace or let us have peace with God. Now, the mass majority of English translations of the Bible go with we have peace. I did a search of English translations, and again, uh, of, of, of the major ones, everybody goes with we have peace. There were, I could find three minor English translations that go with the let us have peace. Now, those three translations, nobody really uses those ones. In fact, I don't even own a paper copy of, of those ones. Uh, they're not popular translations. Now, here is the English word of. One thing that's very interesting about the English word of is it's spelled O-F, but the F isn't pronounced like an F. It's pronounced like a V. We could pronounce it off, but that would sound too much like off, and we don't do that anyways. Uh, I, I have no idea why we pronounce of the way we do, but we do. Um, now, English isn't the only language to do that. Now, it's one thing we, of course, have vowels, and our vowels have long sounds and short sounds, but sometimes our consonants also have uh, different sounds depending on how the word, usually depending on the word's origin and things like that. The same is true in Greek. Now, again, I am not a Greek scholar. Um, I'm not positive how to pronounce this man's last name. Uh, Komoski uh, probably didn't get it there. Uh, he points out that uh, in the Greek they have the omicron, which looks like our lowercase o. They also have the omega, which looks kind of like our w, our lowercase w, but kind of a strange w, isn't it? Uh, that being said, 
uh, the same thing can happen in Greek, both ancient Greek and modern Greek. Uh, and this is the case here. Uh, the uh, verb, it either would have been spelled with the omicron or it would have been spelled with the omega. The thing is, it would have been pronounced the same either way. Uh, we have peace, uh, in which case uh, the verb is indicative. So the person with the faith described in chapters 3 and 4, that person, God the Father and that person have as their relationship status, peace. Now, uh, uh, the, the other way, let us have peace, that would mean that it's in the subjective verb, the person of faith, all, you know, the person described in chapter 3 and 4 with this faith, can now live in the truth of that peaceful status between God the Father and people of faith. So, yes, there is a difference in the meaning, but you've got to admit it's not a huge difference. We either already have this or we need to live in the truth of it. Peace with God. Now, this is a, a very old concept. You see it in the Old Testament. And the idea of peace uh, in, in uh, the Psalms, in the uh, other uh, Old Testament, in the prophets, uh, in the law, uh, when we see it in the New Testament writings, we often see peace and grace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word peace is uh, an interesting word and especially here in the US since the 1960s it's taken on uh, a particular meaning and a particular kind of idea I think that the best way to understand what Paul would mean by having this peace with God is to understand how he viewed somebody without the peace of God uh, I think we see that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Now, and uh, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, uh, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we are two all formerly lived. There's Paul's word all. He likes that word, doesn't he? Uh, among them, we two all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of our flesh and of the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. See that children of wrath. And of course, the word wrath has come up here in the book of Romans. Now, this is the picture that Paul has, and I believe it's a, an accurate biblical picture, of anybody who does not have that faith that uh, Abraham had, that faith and trusting in God uh, through the death of Jesus Christ, that would be this person. And they are by nature children of wrath, the text says. Now, this peace of God, the enmity that is between God and fallen humanity is removed. We can see this as either a consequence or perhaps it would be better to see it as a fruit of the justification. Verse 1, therefore, having been justified, we have this peace with God, the enmity between God and us, because we're no longer part of fallen humanity, that enmity is removed. Verse 2, through whom... Also, we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. So many things, two things going on in this text. Grace in which we stand, and exult in the hope of the glory of God. Now, back in verse 1, uh, it ends with, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, so the through in verse 2 is through Jesus Christ. 
Now the two things, grace in which we stand, the uh, verb stand here in, in the uh, Greek New Testament, Paul's the only one to use this Greek term, but we do find it in other Greek literature. The granting of some special standing. Now verse 1, the justif being justified, we now stand in this grace. And of course this is in the present tense, meaning that by this justification, we continually stand in this grace. Now, uh, here in the NASB, uh, it, it, is ex it is translated exult in the hope of God. Other translations may uh, translate it boast in the hope of the glory of God. Uh, the the hope of the glory of God. Now, of course, the glory of God is, is something that's independent of man. And yet, here is something that Paul is saying that we hope in the glory of God. And what's going on here is in that stance, that standing in grace, we are also hoping for that glory of God restored humanity, remembering that humanity, both male and female, were created in the image of God, being image bearers of God. And the sin, the fall, marred that image. It, uh, it, it wasn't able to erase it. And of course, even today, we believe every person is uh, an image bearer of God, be it a marred image bearer of God, be it a mar marred image of God. But in this, that image of God is restored. Is it restored fully? In one sense, I believe, yes, it is restored fully, keeping in mind that Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that when a person is in Christ, they are a new creation. And that new creation is this restored image of God. However, we still live in this state, in this temporal world, and we've got to admit that we still sin. And therefore, the image of God that we bear is still at least a little bit marred. One day, though, this hope is that the image, the glory of that image of God will be fully restored in us and in all those who stand justified, have peace with God, stand in the grace of God, and are exulting, hoping in that uh restored uh, image of God's state. Uh, with that, I want to thank you guys for joining me this morning. Again, thank you for joining me for such a short devotion. I am going to continue to try and do devotions during this time. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens. I'm going to keep on praying for you. I hope you keep on praying for me. And I just want to thank you guys once again. I hope it's not too long before we see each other again.